Hello and welcome to the Streams Online Pre-Show. I'm Malika Bilal, in for Femi OK. Today we're talking about the world's wildlife. More than half of it has been lost in the past 40 years, according to the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And the UN says international efforts to meet the 2020 conservation targets are failing. So what will it take to protect our natural world? To help us discuss this, we're joined by Carlos Drews, director of the WWF Global Species Program. Krithi Karan, conservation scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. James Burrell, conservation biologist and founder of Discover Conservation, a group that works to support the next generation of conservation scientists. And Paul Jepson, course director of the Masters of Biodiversity Conservation at the University of Oxford. Welcome to you all. Now, we couldn't get this conversation started without introducing my co-host, who I couldn't do it without, Omar Badar. Omar, what will you be getting up to today? Essentially, making sure the community is part of this conversation. We have a lot of disagreement about the importance of conversation, conservation and we have a lot of people who are tweeting in about different things that are happening in their in their countries. For those of you at home, you can tweet us using the hashtag AJStream to make sure that you join the conversation. So to get us started in our icebreaker, warm you up for our international audience that's tuned in a little bit early to our pre-show, I'd love to get an understanding of how you came to this issue. And if there was a moment when you realized that conservation was going to be your life's work, really. James, was there a moment for you? What was it? Yeah, I think absolutely. So um, uh, growing up in, in Essex near London, um, I'd seen wildlife, but obviously nothing like um, some, of, some of the ecosystems that are out there. And when I was 17, I was lucky enough to, to get involved with an expedition to Madagascar and really to see firsthand uh, the incredible rainforests of Madagascar absolutely changed my outlook on life forever. Because the really sad thing is that um, so little is left out there uh, and it really is down to sort of the, the, the present generation they will be the ones to either see it all disappear forever right. or or get to see the amazing process of it reversing and, and us start to get some of our wildlife back wow, so that's James, the real motivation for me that's a, a, amazing and carlos what about you was there a moment Sure, I was 10 years old and my father used to buy these uh, wildlife magazines that would come every week uh, and build together an encyclopedia eventually when you bound them together. And there was one particular issue that uh, I was absolutely fascinated by animals and when I opened it there is this picture of this guy sitting on top of a Land Rover and uh, looking into the African savannas and then I asked my father, what is he? What is this guy? And he said, he's a naturalist. And then I said, I want to be that. <laughs> and really, this was Fe Felix Rodriguez de la Fuente, which is a famous Spanish naturalist that really influenced many of us a lot mm -hmm. uh, in our 50s or, or 60 years. Uh, he was essential for my childhood. Oh, that's amazing. I love that story. Krithi, what about you? Well, I think it's two moments. One, an entire childhood of running around in India's jungles, watching animals for hours together with my father, Ulas Karan. And then I think when I was doing my own research project and field work in this park called Badra in the Western Ghats, and I think doing field work and realizing the real challenges we have in India to try and um, you know meet the needs of people and wildlife at the same time, that's, that's what convinced me that I wanted to be a conservation biologist. Mm. And Paul, was there a moment for you? Well, I don't think there was really a moment. I just grew up bird watching. There was a, I grew up in Leeds, there was a park across the road and just started wandering in it and then when I got a very uncool moped when I was 16 I started <laughs> going to an RSPB reserve and uh, and they just did conservation as part of bird watching and then like James I was a bit of an itinerant travel in my, traveler in my youth or well, still am actually mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I really do remember this time though in Thailand and I, I just had this incredible morning's bird watching up a hill uh, sorry amazing. a mountain right and as I came down the chainsaws were going and I realized that that experience I had right. was going to be extinct. Um, well said. Well, you've heard where their passions lie, what brought them to this. You'll hear from them in just about 30 seconds in the main show. I'm Malika Bilal, in for Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, more than half of the world's wildlife has been lost over the past 40 years as governments fail to meet conservation targets. 
so what will it take to save the natural world? Filling in as digital producer is Omar Badar, and he's looking out for all of your live feedback. So, Omar, more than half lost. What's our community it's saying about that number? really a frightening statistic, and we have people in our community who are concerned about what this means for the future. We have Alex here who tweets in saying, after 34 years of conservation efforts, species still decline by 52%. What will happen in the next 34 years? He may be out by a few years, but the point still stands. Why this matters to us and what the impact will be and what can be done about it is what this conversation is about. You can join it by tweeting us using the hashtag you see on the screen right now, AJStream, and we'll get to those tweets during the show. I'm Gidon Bromberg, I'm from Friends of the Earth Middle East, working on transboundary water issues, and I'm in the stream. More than half of the world's animals have been lost over the last four decades. That's according to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF. Their scientists landed at this shocking statistic after looking at 10,000 different animal populations, covering 3,000 different species. They say the leading cause of this decline is unsustainable levels of hunting and fishing, habitat degradation, as well as climate change. Back in 2010, more than 200 environment ministers from all over the world gathered in Japan and agreed on a set of conservation targets to be met by the year 2020. But a recent UN progress report said governments are failing to meet their own goals. So with an ongoing decline in wildlife populations and governments not doing enough to stop the loss, what and who is going to protect the natural world on which we all depend? Well, to help us talk about this, we're joined by Carlos Drews, director of the WWF Global Species Program. Krithi Karanth, conservation scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. James Borrell, conservation biologist and founder of Discover Conservation. And Paul Jepson, course director of the Masters of Biodiversity Conservation at the University of Oxford. Welcome to you all. I want to start on my laptop because there's a line in the introduction to the WWF report that really struck me and it reads, this latest edition of the Living Planet Report is not for the faint-hearted. Carlos, what is it in the report that you believe the world must know? Yes, indeed, it's very worrisome when we declare that we have lost 52% of the animals over the last 40 years. But let me just briefly explain. This is the world's average of, uh, as you explained, 3,000 species and their population trends over time. But it hasn't been like that throughout the world equally. Uh, there is very alarming signs from Latin America as the region that stands out with the greatest losses at 83% over the last 40 years. And then if you compare the temperate regions of the world, which tend to be also the richest, uh, that's where you have less losses than in the tropical region, which is where most of the species occur. You can also analyze by marine, terrestrial, and there the losses were in the order of 40%, but in fresh water, in the lakes, the rivers, the marshes, we have a, an, a loss of 76%. So that's the one that worries us a lot also because it's alarming, it's unprecedented. It has to do with pollution, with the dams that have been built, with the uh, uh, flow of uh, fertilizers from agriculture into rivers and lakes and so on. So let's be clear, uh, it's not equal around the world right. and the rich countries are better off than the poorest countries at protecting their biodiversity. So Paul, I, I want to pick apart uh, the stats that you just heard Car Carlos talk about. And one of them he mentioned was the freshwater species down 76% in the past 40 years. Paul, how did we get to this point? Well, um, I mean, we can talk about the, uh, you know, the situation with dams, water extraction, but we can also say that part of the reason uh, there's been such a decline in freshwater species is because they're out of sight, and they're, because they're out of sight, they're out of mind. We can see the terrestrial species, the species and animals on, you know, on the land, but what happens under the freshwaters and what happens under the oceans? We just don't, we don't see it, therefore there isn't the same level of concern. You know, there isn't a single species freshwater conservation NGO, you know, a group who are really going for freshwater. So maybe that's part of, uh, of the problem, is, is that part of the problem is the response, not only uh, you know, the very severe threats that our freshwater systems uh, uh, are facing. 
So we have people in our online community who are still not sure why this is important. We have Stanley here who tweets in saying caring about wildlife could be a luxury if your daily basic needs aren't directly linked to immediate biodiversity itself. And we have here on Google Plus, Henry says the UN should help humanity not save animals while people are dying of hunger and sickness because of poverty. James, for the people who don't make the link directly between saving animals and how that impacts us, what would you say, what would you say to them to make that link? Yeah, absolutely. I can completely understand that perspective, you know, absolutely. Uh, but I think that's a really uh, popular misconception. Um, so when I when I went on my first expedition, I thought it would be a very simple sort of situation of, of talking to the Malagasy people, explaining how valuable their rainforest was, and just asking them very nicely if they would stop cutting it down. But when you meet your, your first uh, sort of local guide and, and you realize that he's, he's cut down just one more hectare, um, just so he has a little bit more land to feed his growing family, how can you say that you know what he's doing is wrong? But I think what we're understanding more and more in, the, in just the last couple of decades is quite how important natural ecosystems are for us. Um, it, it really isn't a luxury in any sense. They, they filter the air, um, they, they filter the water, they provide all the resources and food and crops that we need. Um, there's even links to disease and things now. They think increased deforestation is bringing us into contact with, uh, with, with, with diseases and making us much more vulnerable to them. So there's a huge body of research that's showing how in every aspect of our lives, we're really dependent on the natural world. But unfortunately, a lot of us just, uh, we, we haven't really realized quite how important that is, and we think it's a luxury. Well, Krithi, I'd like you to pick up on that point as well. With so many people around the world living in poverty and, and really struggling to get by day by day, can conservation be considered a luxury? Are you uh, in James's camp where you say no, of course not? I, I don't think it's considered a luxury. Actually, I think India represents the extreme end of the spectrum where you have 1.2 billion people living aside a hell of a lot of wildlife still. And I, I want to counter that by saying, you know, we have 700 million people living in poverty, but we have 50% of the world's tigers and most of the world's Asian elephants and a whole lot, lot of other species. So yes, we've lost uh, tigers from 60% of India, we've lost lions from 90-odd percent of India, but what's left is still there and it's there largely because we have a park system that's sort of working and a lot of tolerance of people who live aside wildlife in India. So I think um, I don't, I don't, I think lumping it as poverty is a very simple way of looking at it. So there's yeah, I would agree with this if I could come in. Please do. Yeah, so I think what we also need to remember is that the, one of the origins of the conservation movements came out of workers' rights movements, and it was the, the recognition that people living in cities and poor people, live, workers living in cities, need access to green space and need access to recreation. And actually, nature and countryside is one of the cheapest ways you can deliver uh, that. I mean, when we think of the, you know, as economies uh, take off and people come out of the abject po poverty, they, they get a bit of recreation, they want to do things. And you know, going out, uh, day tripping, enjoying wildlife is, is really the next step in the development cycle. And many countries have been through this. And I worry that if we're not saving wildlife and wild places, we're actually closing down the next level of uh, development. So, Carlos, we have an interesting disagreement online about where the primary focus ought to be in terms of moving forward. We have Nafisa here who tweets in saying, the first big step is education. People won't change if they don't understand or don't know. But we also have Emma here who tweets in saying, societies built in this way that don't value protection of wildlife. The biggest challenge is human resistance to change. Uh, uh, do you think that the problem is that people don't know or that they know but they just can't bring themselves to take the actions needed to actually do something about this? I definitely think those two are key elements in understanding why we haven't made progress. So there has to be a big space there for education and awareness. But we also have to understand the political level of things. Imagine the marine resources, and here we're talking the fish, these are animals as well. Let's not forget that the animals are not just the charismatic ones and the, the cuddly and beautiful ones. Uh, fish are the, susten the, the sustenance of millions of people and probably 660 million jobs worldwide. So these are the people, their job security and their families that would suffer if uh, fish are not harvested sustainably. And they are definitely 90% are either at the top of overexploitation or are already overexploited. So when that becomes uh, a, an awareness moment for the, for the leaders that make the decisions, say the presidents and the ministers of the environment, then they will do something about it because it's job security and it's actually food security what we're talking about here. So there has to be that level of awareness as well. 
and then we have to elevate conservation to the highest levels of priorities and link it together with development needs, particularly for the generations to come. And then you're getting an equation that slowly, slowly should be working. But Carlos, of course, as we mentioned at the very top of the show, they haven't been doing enough about it. But, but locally, I, I there are differences. Oh, there, Car there are Carlos, uh, cases of success. Uh, Carlos so will finish his point, and then Krithi, you'll, you'll pick up. Carlos? Yeah. Okay. Just very quickly, uh, with a few examples here. Think also of Rwanda. Rwanda has decided to put uh, gorillas into the highest level of protection, the mountain gorillas, the black uh, large gorillas that everyone has seen in the movies. Now this is a 200 million a year industry from tourism and the tourism expenditure inside the country. It has become the main source of foreign currency for Rwanda. So all of a sudden you get a whole country betting on, the, on this particular species. Of course, not everybody has gorillas in their backyards, but this is just one way to look at biodiversity and then market it accordingly and provide for livelihoods and benefits to the communities that surround it. Kriti? Uh, I, I just want to make two points. I think uh, engaging public is really important, but my own criticism of uh, most conservation biologists is that we uh, cry wolf all the time and you're going to lose people when you do that and we don't celebrate the successes, we don't celebrate the recoveries. If you look at the stories that the media covers and most of, most of us end up talking about everything going, we don't talk about the stories where things have come back. And I know in India there are places where wildlife was completely gone in the 90s. 1950s and we have higher populations of a lot of wildlife today of you know 60 years later and we don't celebrate that and I think the other issue is I think we need to look beyond governments and the UN I think it's time for individuals and uh, you know public private partnerships and trying to look at new ways to uh, set aside land and you know uh, pro promote conservation and well, I th Prithi, think I'm actually glad that you brought that up because of course that is exactly what you do and one of the things that uh, it's part of the things that you do is uh, give talks about rewilding this is a phenomenon uh, that I'm hoping you can explain to uh, our audience is it more than just taking species and putting them back into an environment where they once were so there's, I think there's the, that word's kind of used in different contexts and I just want to clarify one thing. There's one group of people who believe that rewilding is reintroducing populations and letting them come back. I'm actually not in uh, a huge favor of, of that approach. When I talk about rewilding, I'm just talking about building spaces for wildlife and to put that in context for you, India has set aside just, you know, 3% of land that's protected, but there's a heck of a lot of wildlife that's found outside. And so what I'm trying to get people engaged in is that we need the three percent that's already protected but a lot of tigers and leopards and wolves move outside and so we need to set aside land outside and get you know individuals and corporations and partnerships going that that supports uh, animal movement and animal populations outside parks as well you know on the government track of what governments can do we have this video comment from david take a listen to this if governments aren't going to regulate to protect our environment, then it is up to us to pressure them to. If they're not going to uh, regulate, then we can lobby our representatives, we can get on the streets and protest, or if need be, we can vote in a new government. It is up to us to hold our governments to account so that they can protect our natural resources. So, James, do you think it could be said that maybe part of the problem is that people are maybe focusing a little too much on what they individually can do or with organi through organizations, when this is a big enough problem that maybe it needs government in action and that's where the bulk of where people's efforts should be focused on? Yeah, I think that, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, I think it's very easy to um, focus on a, on a lot of the negative things that are happening in conservation when we should be focusing on, on the positive. And then it's quite easy to, to try and pick a scapegoat to think, oh, well, you know, if we change the government, things would be different. I think really um, the best thing that an individual can do is just become educated about the issues. Unfortunately, um, when it comes to campaigning for governments, then you generally have to sort of keep your message simple. You want, you want this or you want that or you want this area protected or you want this sort of policy. But often in conservation, things are actually really, really complicated. Um, there is no yeah, simple Kikoli, uh, quick comedian, fix. Yeah. There is no, no yeah. right answer. So um, I, re I really think that the more people become educated, um, then 
that will have a spillover into into the policies the governments go for. And, and Paul, I heard you speak up and, you know, you wrote a piece that caught our eye, five ways to stop the world's wildlife from vanishing. What is the uh, uh, number one way to really reverse this or to halt it? Well, this was a, just a discussion piece, but just sort of picking up first on those things. I think there has been a narrative for the last 40 years of asking government to do more. And of course, government does need to do more. But also we need to recognize that gov the, the days of big government are gone. The way things happen now are much more decentralized and much more ne networked. So one of the messages I, I, you know, I did put in this five ways uh, to save our vanishing, vanishing wildlife was the suggestion that actually what we need to do is decentralize conservation more. We need to move away from our uh, this sort of strong institutionalized way of doing conservation and, and do, you know, almost sort of loosen up a little bit, recognize that there's multiple ways, there's different ways of doing conservation in different countries and actually just create the, the space for, for people to come together in networks and, and, and make things happen. So not just rely on blaming the government, but actually ask what we can do as societies, as cities, as communities to, uh, you know, make uh, the space around us more wildlife friendly. So we I have think, the, um, just, Carlos? Just, just building on... Just yes, building. I want to comment on Paul. I think he's absolutely right. Uh, and there is an example, actually, where uh, civil society and governments came together to take a, a very important decision in the 70s, which was to prohibit worldwide uh, commercial whaling. And we just saw a short video clip of grey whales coming back from the brink of extinction. Actually, the good news is that blue whales are also coming back and humpback whales. I had a chance of being on a kayak nine years ago with my two uh, uh, children and we managed in Costa Rica to go all the way very close to a female humpback uh, whale and she was holding her baby with, with, with her head up, sunbathing it on the surface of the ocean. It was extremely moving moment, perhaps one of the most moving uh, in my life, I broke in tears. And I just think that if my children are able to take their children to see whales, then that's definitely the, the way forward and we are seeing whales coming back. But right. it would be a horrific thought if they had to tell their children that our generation was irresponsible enough to let the whales go extinct. Right. So we have some of the challenges that people are talking about online. We have Nephew who here tweets in, says, In Africa, it's one thing to formulate anti-poaching laws, but it's entirely another problem to implement those laws. And then we have this video comment here also from Ben Novak. He's a research and science consultant for the Long Now Foundation. Listen to this. We really don't fix the problem unless we allow these populations to move from viable habitat to other viable habitat regions as the world changes. Our transportation systems have fundamentally dissected this planet for wildlife. There are practical things people can be lobbying for and building themselves right now. That's overpasses and underpasses over highways to be able to facilitate the movement of species that have been disrupted by the way we've changed this planet. So James, this looks like a practical solution that, you know, a lot of people would be on board of. Do you think it could make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Cert certainly in the, in the developed world. Um, I know in the Netherlands and places like that, there's been a, a lot of work on these overpasses and underpasses. But something I think we always have to keep in mind is sort of the economics of conservation. Um, to take a very realistic approach, I, I sort of I believe in um, getting the most for your money, uh, and that's why you know in the UK we spend m uh, nine times as much on, on biodiversity conservation sort of in the UK than we do abroad, and I really think that should be entirely the other way around. Uh, investing that amount of money, um, you know, in tropical rainforests where the biodiversity is so much greater, um, I think that you know time is short. We could we could get a lot more return on our money for that. You know, Paul. It's probably not popular, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see how popular it will be. But Paul, I wonder if too much emphasis is really put on what the effects of the decreasing wildlife uh, will mean for humankind, and and not enough for what it means for the animals and the wildlife that we share this planet with. What are your thoughts on that? Um. I mean, I think, you know, as humans, we tend to be quite self-interested. So uh, the talk is always going to be about what it means for us. But I think, you know, as a species, we, we do love wildlife and it's part of 
being human to enjoy wildlife and engage with wildlife. So I'm not quite sure that we ever have to get into this quite dualistic talk. I mean, I'm increasingly seeing wildlife, um, it's interesting when we talk about the governments, how we have to talk to governments, and at the moment we have to talk in terms of natural capital, you know, nature as a stock of resources which can help humanity or whatever. But actually the, the idea of, you can't really say wildlife capital, it just doesn't seem to work. So this is more thinking for me of wildlife or nature as an asset, an asset which we can invest in and generate all sorts of forms of value. That might be economic value, it might be value in terms of uh, you know, timber to um, uh, use or whatever. But it's all of those more you know, sort of ephemeral forms of value, identity, community, um, you know, aesthetic appreciation and, and so forth. So I'm always a bit, you know, not quite into sort of making these these distinctions between what's in it for wildlife or should we be looking for wildlife sort of more deep ecology views and the human views. I think I think we're part of the planet and we're part of intertwined systems. Well, Krithi, since you shared a success story with us, uh, in, in your own um, neck of the world, really, what positives have you seen? What is the outcome, the positive outcome you've seen? Oh, I think there's uh, hundreds of positive outcomes, actually. Um, what we're beginning to see is a large part of India is going urban. So there's huge opportunities here for, you know, farmlands are being abandoned and their space being created for wildlife. There's huge opportunities for tourism if promoted the right way so that people can go watch wildlife and pay local communities who live close and with wildlife. And uh, I've also seen, you know, um, uh, moving people out of parks is a very controversial issue, but I've seen it done right in a few parks in India where people uh, were voluntarily moved out, out, of, uh, out of parks and they are doing very well outside. So I think it, it's coming up with a range of solutions and not, not getting fixated on one particular way to do things. And even in a country like India, it's, it's very, very local, it's very, very regional and not, um, not, not getting bogged down by you know, global numbers. And I, I think there's a lot of successes to celebrate. So sticking to the idea of successes, we have tons of video comments, by the way, today. We have one more from Lita. Take a listen to this. The key point to remember when we hear these very frightening numbers about the decline of biodiversity is that right now the choice is up to us. We can save species. We see by the example of the United States when we passed the Endangered Species Act in 1973, we were able to make a difference. We were able to pull back species from the brink of extinction. And we really had success in protecting species. And we hope that individuals will join us in taking action to protect species every day. Carlos, we discussed earlier in the show about how some people just looked at the track record of how many species we lost and that did not give them hope. What kinds of things give you hope that we can move things in, the, in a positive direction moving forward? Well, there are, there are numerous uh, local, local successes and I think Kriti was very good at, uh, at, at illustrating several of those. Uh, I think the fact that some countries have decided to bet on biodiversity for their development, such as Costa Rica, who has made a tremendous investment in protecting their biodiversity and now is well known as a prime destination to look at wildlife and natural areas. Uh, Gabon is less known, but uh, the president of Gabon has made a pledge to turn Gabon into a prime ecotourism destination as well. So those are positive stories, I believe. Uh, they give us hope. Uh, let me just uh, also mention briefly something that Paul uh, touched on, the concept of assets. And if you regard biodiversity as an asset, then what is it that I do with my money, with my savings? I put them in a bank, in a very well managed, very safe place. Those are the protected areas of the world. But are they really a safe place and are they really well managed? Well, this report taught us that the decline in protected areas has been only half of the decline of animals worldwide. So protected areas are working and that gives us again hope that the protected area system is actually one of the tools to get us eventually and, there. And Carlos, it's with that hope that I have to pause the conversation. We'll pick it up with all of our guests in the online post show at stream.aljazeera.com. Now on the next show, did you know three raw onions, salt water and condensed milk can cure Ebola? It really cannot, but these are a few of the myths that some people believe. And on Thursday, we'll look at the misinformation that continues to spread faster than the virus itself. Until then, we'll see you online.
Hello, this is The Stream's online post show. We've been talking about possible solutions to ongoing losses in wildlife populations. So I want to bring us back to this discussion starting on my laptop. Now this is Yellowstone Park's website and it shows a wolf. In 1995, wolves were reintroduced to the park um, and they had been absent from the park for more than 70 years. And it's all part of rewilding, which is something that Krithi was telling us about a, a, a little bit earlier. But James, I'm wondering if you can pick up on that because as someone who is going out into these populations um, and, and trying to encourage this among the youth, do you see a lot of receptive people who think this is a good idea and this is how we stem the flow? You know, I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of young people who maybe aren't from a conservation background um, are possibly a bit, a bit bored, a bit numb of, of a lot of the, the negative kind of news that, 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 that the media comes out with, you know, um, you know, about these declines and things. And so I think when you get the idea of uh, whether it's right or wrong, reintroducing things like wolves, elk, beavers into the Scottish Highlands and other species around the world, I think it really captures their imagination. I think there's a, a big debate to be had about uh, what we should do and where and, 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 and what, what sort of methods we use. But it really has sort of reignited a bit of the debate. And I think it's amazing to, to think that probably a lot of the youth in the UK today don't realize that wolves once roamed um, right across this country. Um, so, so for education, it, it's already done amazing things. Carlos, mm. I, I also want to show our audience what's at risk here. Now, this is a picture that went pretty viral. This was shared widely online. And um, these are walruses. This is a picture released by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And it's showing 35,000 walruses that came to shore. And this is due to climate change because the ice, the sea ice really that they favor has disappeared. Why does this matter? Can you describe for us, really, break it down for our audience, what does a life without wildlife look like? All right, yeah, the issue of climate change is important because if we add climate change to the overexploitation from hunting, fishing, and the habitat loss and the degradation of it, then you have the perfect storm for uh, wildlife declines. But the wildlife decline is just the thermometer of the way in which humankind has been managing the ecosystems, basically their natural uh, capacity, their natural abilities, their food security and so on. So it's just bad news and what the walrus is telling us is that not managing our CO2 emissions responsibly will lead us to very, very dire situations. Uh, sea level is rising already in several islands of the South Pacific and uh, some of the populations are actually seeking refuge in, 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 in the mainland uh, because they don't see a future anymore in their, in, on their islands. I mean, that's a very imminent uh, threat. And I have spoken to fishermen in Latin America who told me that these days they have to go farther away because the fish are further away and even deeper. And now we know that that has to do again with the warming of the planet because the fish will continue to seek the same temperature envelope uh, to which they are used to. And that makes all of a sudden the journey no longer profitable. And you're seeing that these economies are being challenged by climate change. So the situation is very dire from any point of view. The little golden toad was lost in Costa Rica in the late 80s, and I was unable to take a photograph of it. There is a bit of a spiritual and recreational value, of course, to the species when they are lost. But there are also very profound food security issues that go alongside. Right. Yep. To switch gears a little bit just on the question of consumption, we have a lot of conversation about that. We have Zach here on Facebook who says, we need to change our consumption patterns so that people in poor and rich countries alike consume only what they need. But we also have here Omar on Twitter saying, increase in human population leads to the destruction of vegetation and wildlife, <coughs> mostly for building settlements. Paul, are you concerned given all the projections basically driving us towards overpopulation, that this is going to be a really gargantuan challenge to try to overcome? Well, there's absolutely no doubt that the planet and wildlife is up against it at the moment. I mean, you know, when you look at what is going on, we're in a serious situation. But we can't just talk about, you know, the problems. We've got to come with vision. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people, but there's a lot of bright people, there's a lot of caring people. How can we actually mobilize people to start shaping the, the future, you know, planet which we which we want but that planet isn't going to look or you know it's not going to look like it was 50 years ago it's going to be a different um, uh, uh, planet earth in the future it's about 
how can we get that vision and that shaping going ahead? And you know, we talked about rewilding, and I'm a, a big uh, fan of rewilding, maybe because it's it's really a label for a space of creating think creative thinking and imagining, and a, a space where people from all walks of life can come in and talk about what sort of vision do they want for wildlife and for the planet. So absolutely, we're you know we're in a desperate situation, but it's just about to, just bringing that vision back there. in. James? Just to build on Paul there, I think he's absolutely right. I think for, for young conservationists, and I hope a lot of your audience are young, aspiring conservationists, it's a really, really exciting time to live. I think yeah. one thing we've got to remember is that half the wildlife is lost, but amazingly, despite everything, half of it's still there. And, you know, in my lifetime, I hope to see the reverse of, of biodiversity loss. You know, I hope in the next 50 years, we're going to reach a point where biodiversity is at its minimum and, and we start to see some of it come back. Um, and I think that's a really exciting time time to live in. And you know, can I just come back in? A, sorry, it, it, please, can I just go say ahead. one last thing? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I think the other thing we haven't touched on as well, looking ahead, is we're entering an information revolution. We've got incredible technologies now, computing as a utility, all of what that brings with it. I mean, part of what we can be thinking about is how we can harvest this incredible new, you know, thing this, uh, to, to see how we can mobilize people and shape that world going ahead. How can we? What, what, what do you suggest? Well, th there's all sorts of things which we, we can look at uh, going on. I mean, one of the things which is really happening is that we're going to be able to monitor wildlife and the world much better. I mean, the, the advent of, uh, of low-cost drones. It, it, it also, we're getting much more citizen reporting going on. So this this accountability of government. Um, I mean, Kariti will know that you know the, the rise of the news media stations in India. That there's there's elephants which are you know in, in uh, struggling in situations being filmed constantly, and the government are having to do something a, a, about things. So there's all sorts of things we can start thinking about. I mean, I don't have the answers to this, but there's a lot of young creative conservationists there who I'm sure are going to mobilise this. Uh, this technology and, and you know we're going to find new ways of doing things and we've got to keep positive. Right well it looks like James agrees with you there and, and on keeping positive on that note you know James did say this is an exciting time to live. Mm -hmm. On the other hand though we see stats like this and this is from the report that we started this show with today's average global rate of consumption needs one and a half earths to sustain it. Four Earths to sustain US levels and two and a half Earths for UK levels. So you see things like that. And then uh, uh, Carlos, leave us with something hopeful. How do you reconcile that with the optimism that James feels? Yes, I really like James's take on it as the glass is still half full. And if I may uh, reveal a little detail that is found in the report. We love revelations. About these 10,000 <laughs> uh, populations. And out of these 10,000 populations, the majority are actually on the increase. A very slight increase. That's the majority. But the extent of the decline turns the average into a 52% loss worldwide. I think that if we look at this, majority of populations on the increase we actually have again a way of turning the glass upside down and having it half full like james uh, concluded mm. kriti what about you half full have them have empty oh always half full always uh, but i just want to jump in into the rewilding discussion uh, we were having earlier and i unfortunately I, I mean, kriti I, we're running out of time so if you can just okay. sum that up in about 30 seconds because i do want to hear what you have to say sum it up in 30 seconds and then we'll get the rest from you online using hashtag aj stream i think we still need to not lose focus on the wild places and wildlife that we're already invested in in new places reintroducing species is fine but the places we have set aside we d we cannot take our eye off the ball there mm. so we, we we heard what yeah, carlos so Prithi, James, and Paul had to say they all sound pretty optimistic, which I think is a great place to be. The community, optimistic? We have a nice optimistic closing note that's actually a little philosophical, which I like to close the show on. We have Sir Charles here who says, to save wildlife, man must cut down on greed, slow down on love for ornamental things, and embrace wildlife as our heritage. And then we have Lao Tzu here who says, humans need to take the next step in our evolution, live with nature, not destroy it, an ecocentric approach is needed. All of our guests are smiling. It looks like they agree as well. We'll continue this conversation online, though. Hashtag AJStream. Now, on the next show, did you know three raw onions, salt water, and condensed milk can cure Ebola?
it really can not. But these are a few of the myths that some believe. And on Thursday, we'll look at the misinformation that continues to spread faster than the virus itself. See you online.